What's up, guys? Welcome back. This is Hayden Schapp. I am doing a uh, deep dive today in the first creation or what is a pivotal part of being able to set and achieve any goal and ensure the highest likelihood of being able to achieve the goals that you set. So this is a principle from the seven habits of highly effective people. And I've been doing a study of that, um, all of the concepts there, kind of just going through the book. It's like a hybrid of reading the audio book, but the parts that stand out to me and then commenting on what I'm learning and what I have learned in the past, um, this has been a really insightful study for me. So if you like this and it's valuable to you, then share it with three or four people that might be able to use it. And uh, definitely um, subscribe to the channels for to my YouTube channel so that you can get more of this stuff as well as um, follow any of the other mediums for audio. Um, I'm basically just doing this study for me, or at least I started doing it just for me because it's the way that I've found to most deeply ingrain these principles within myself. I've been studying the seven habits of highly effective people and the concepts for not only personal development, but leadership, uh, character-based leadership development as well for the last seven or eight years, explicitly out of seven habits for the last seven or eight years. But a lot of these concepts even taught to me by um, mentors and my father since I was a kid. And um, it's just been really impactful this time around. I was reading Covey's words at the beginning of Seven Habits as I started studying again. And uh, they said, he says, the best way to ingrain these principles is to study with the intent to teach. And so my version of that has been just to make my study public and see if anyone follows along. But more importantly, for myself, become a better version of me through the study. So hopefully you're getting something out of it. Um, if you're following along with your own insights, that's where it's going to be most impactful. If not, I think it's just fun to listen to. And definitely there are life-changing, impactful concepts here that will put you on a course to not only achieve whatever you want in abundance, but not lose your soul in the process, become the best version of yourself in all the aspects that you care about most. And definitely the ones that you will care about most at the end of your life based on the contribution and the legacy that you leave behind. So I directly work with salesmen and saleswomen, salespeople, um, and I love sales and business. I'm fascinated with the concepts of uh, persuasion and influence from a truth-centered perspective, meaning like what's actually best for both parties, making things a win-win and persuading people out of goodness rather than just manipulating them. I'm also fascinated with personal and character development and doing that in a principal and truth-centered way. And I'm very, very interested in learning and teaching leadership um, from a truth centered lens. So that's what I talk about. If you like that, make sure you um, share and, you know, enjoy the content. So I'm going to get back into the seven habits here because this is for me where this is getting really like it's there's a lot of work that goes into making this meaningful and doing the deep work of your mission statement. And what's your guiding North star habit? One is all about becoming the type of person who is capable of creating your life consciously, what you actually want, and using the unique human endowments to do that. Things that nobody, no other species has on this earth. Um, if we don't use them, we're basically just like those other animals. So that's being self-aware, having a, uh, an imagination to dream up something in the future and take responsibility for it. Um, and go create it and then conscience being able to guide our decisions based off of a moral compass of right and wrong And th th that's what Covey claims is the unique human endowments and he's pulling from a lot of different people there Jung um, Victor Frankl and others So what I find fascinating about that concept is that we're always the creator of our own life But where that's bad is if we're creating our life on autopilot if we're not even consciously thinking um, what scripts we are playing out in the real world that have been either handed to us or that we've developed based on habits <clears throat> or that were a byproduct of the things that have happened to us in our lives or just people, right? I might be the product of somebody else's first creation for me. Everything is created twice, but that doesn't mean that I'm the one that's creating uh, that I'm that every creation for second creation is by conscious design, meaning like, Covey claims that the first creation is a true principle, whether you're aware of it or not. This isn't something that just you disregard. You break yourself against this principle. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, I was having a, a funny, this idea of breaking yourself against truth is kind of interesting because I was having a uh, kind of a witty uh, banter back and forth like conversation with a, a friend where we were talking about how much REM sleep we were getting because we're like tracking like everything really meticulously REM sleep, like exertion during workouts, like your, the, your, your battery during the day, um, stress levels, all this stuff. 
I mean, I just got like 13 vials of blood work done for like 48, um, a 48 marker blood panel, which is like, just, when do you ever need that except for to meticulously know just how your body's functioning and optimize your body and your mind. Um, so we were, we were joking about some of this stuff and I was like, dude, he was getting so much more REM sleep than me. This is so, this is so dumb. He was getting so much more REM sleep and I'm like, bro, I'm going to definitely beat you in getting REM sleep tomorrow, tonight. And, uh, he's like, listen, Hayden, REM sleep is not something that you win at. Okay. It's something that you break yourself against or you harness for your good. <laughs> Cause we'd been joking about this idea of breaking yourself against laws and principles, um, or harnessing them to like achieve what we want. And I was like, gosh, dang it, dude. Yeah. How are you supposed to be competitive in REM sleep? If that's a, just a, it's a natural cycle type of thing. And so you either do it the right way or you break yourself against it. And, uh, so last night I got much more REM sleep than I normally do. Cause I was, um, I'm focused on trying to make, make that happen and using some biomarker tools to help as well. Anyway, the first creation is one of these concepts as well. We can't ignore it. We just either harness it for our good or we break ourselves against it. Meaning I'm always acting out the second creation of something that was first created either by conscious design of myself or by others or by circumstances or by, uh, what does Covey say? Conditions, conditioning or other people essentially, or I choose it myself. Right. And so that's the idea is to become conscious that we are the creator. And so therefore we got to own the past so we can create the future because you can't have one without the other. You can't go create a new future and be in charge of it and take responsibility. If you don't realize that you already were in charge of the, the way you responded to your conditions, conditioning, or your habits or other people. So it's not the fa where we are now is like in the past. It's like a, what did Rafiki say when where he's with uh, Simba and he hits it on the head and he's like all upset about it. And he's like, it's in the past. You can't, it's like, you can't go back and take that back. You can't wish the pain was different. It's the same. It's not changing. It's in your circle of concern, meaning like you cannot go influence what has already happened. You can't influence the mistakes that you've made. You can't even influence what's already happened to other, other people. Unfair as it might be, what is other people have done to you or where your life is right now, good or bad. So if that's true though, we have to acknowledge that like where I am is a result of not only my conditions, conditioning and other people, and maybe some of my own conscious design, where I am is a result of the choices that I have made between the stimulus of my conditions, conditions or other people, and the response that I had to it. I had a choice there. I was either operating in that choice on autopilot, unconscious of my ability to choose, or, and blaming other people, relinquishing my power to choose to the conditions, conditioning or circumstances, um, or other people, or I'm choosing to respond. And the idea is to become fully empowered as a proactive human being to embody proactivity by choosing that space that lies in between stimulus and response, choosing how we behave there. Cause we have that choice and sure. I wish things might be, it would have been different. We all do. Right. It's like a, if you talk to a lot of people that have a lot of Bitcoin, I have a good friend. Well, he's, I wouldn't, I actually am not allowed to call him a good friend because I don't I haven't known him for super long, but I have a buddy of mine, a friend that I talk to frequently who has made upwards of $600 million in cryptocurrency. In, in, in Bitcoin and like in the crypto game, right? So the crypto asset game, cryptographic assets, he's made $600 million plus. Um, and it's been interesting to like get to know him and kind of bounce ideas off him because I've been in the crypto game since like 2016, late 2016, early 2017. And <clears throat> the more that I talk to him, the more that I realize that, um, freak, where was I going with this? I just lost my train of thought. Uh, it's like in the, in, in the Bitcoin game, whenever you are, uh, like people that have a lot of Bitcoin, they always wish that they had more. That's where I was going with it. I lost my train of thought. Um, so that's kind of how this is. It's like, we always, even if we're like living a good life, you kind of always wish you could go back and change things a little bit from what you learn in the, in the, in the short term or in the current now hindsight's 2020 in the sense that you always look back and that, my man, I could have made, I could have been a little bit better. I could have uh, made a little bit different choices. Right. Um, and that's kind of how it's funny because like the guys that have a lot of Bitcoin or a little bit of Bitcoin, they're always saying that same thing. Yeah. I mean, I might be relative, have relatively more than most people, but I always wish I had more. It's how I feel. 
Uh, that's definitely how Ricardo feels. And my, I probably, no, I don't know if I should say his name. Nobody will be able to find him. I can't find him on social media anywhere. Um, but he does exist. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of, that's how he feels. And he's made 600 plus million dollars, probably actually more. And that's how I feel. I've made more than most in that. And then that's how anyone feels it's at the beginning. So it's like, it's not a unique thing to say, like, I wish I could have changed the past. I wish I had more. I wish I would have done things differently. But those things are in the past. You can't change them. But you do have to own the fact that where you are is because of how you responded to those things from the past. That space in between the stimulus, what happened to you, and the res your response to it. That space where you had the power to either relinquish your ability to choose to other people or choose yourself. You have to own that. Because you pick up one end of the stick there, you pick up this other end of the stick, which is, okay, now I can actually own my future too. Covey says, when we get into, ha that's habit one, be proactive. When we get into habit two, habit two is basically saying, now that I know I have taken, re I can take responsibility for my future because, and I have taken responsibility for the past. Now that I know I am the creator, I'm always the creator. I always was, whether on autopilot or by conscious design. But now that I realize I am the creator, now... How do I lead myself to create what is best for my life? Identify those things, my vision and my values. Use my unique human endowment of self-awareness, which is what we use a lot in Habit One, of imagination, being able to conjure up a world that doesn't currently exist. And uh, and um, your moral compass, your conscience. Covey says your conscience isn't just being able to say, oh, I'm choosing between right and wrong. Your conscience is is this ability to identify your unique traits that make you uniquely you and your mission and who you are beyond just something in the short term, um, beyond just the titles that can be easily taken away from you. Conscience allows you to identify those things, which is kind of a fascinating idea, I think. So conscience isn't just like the, this moral right or wrong type of thing. It's who am I uniquely at my core? What are my unique talents and abilities? And how can I use those to go bless other people? Um, and to create for myself the life that I want, but more importantly, bless other people. So th with that, that's actually where we just ended off on this last one. I like kind of doing a, a different version of a recap every time, even though that could, you know, if I say, okay, I'm going to recap last time. It's for me, whenever I listen back to it, whenever I've said that, that sounds like boring. I might tune out there. But like, as I keep listening to myself, like reiterate and try, I'm, what I'm doing is trying to more even persuasively like talk about how these things all fit together before we move on to the next thing, which is super helpful for me, even though it's taking 12 minutes and 32 seconds. Okay. Let's get into where we left off last time as just a recap. I was reading uh, with a buddy of mine, some stuff from habit one, which is kind of fun uh, or pre habit one, I guess. Um, so now we're going to get into, as you watch me scroll through here, uh, habit two, and we were already in habit two. Victor Frankl, we, he talks about how like we don't actually choose. So what does he say? We don't uncover our mission. We detect it, basically. Um, this is kind of a unique concept. What is the actual quote? Let me find it real here. Um, so living on a principal center, people can't live with change if there's not a changeless core inside of us. Man, that's really amazing. Um, this quote by Victor Frankl is the one I'm trying to find, which is right here. Frankel says we detect rather than invent our missions in life. We like, and then he, he's going to go on. So like, this was kind of confusing for me when I first read it. And even so today, I'm going to flesh out this idea a little bit. Um, cause the Victor Frankel says, ultimately man should not ask what the meaning of life is, but rather must recognize that it is he who is asked in a word. Each man is questioned by life and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life to life. He can only be, he can only respond by being responsible. I love that. So for me, when I first read that, I'm like, okay, Victor Frankl is saying these people who are like, where's my passion? I can't find my passion. I'm just waiting to find my passion. Well, you choose your passion. You go find you, you proactively go create your passion. But, and that, that's kind of what Victor Frankl is saying here. But if you read the, the paragraph just above this, it's even different than that. So he says, it's, you don't invent your passion or your mission in life you detect it rather. And that's how, where Covey is saying, like when we go into this first creation of like, what is the life I truly want? The most optimal way to do that is to begin to use our human endowment of conscience to start detecting what our, our unique mission is not inventing it because we don't fabricate that. We do choose it though. And we detect it, um, which is kind of an interesting idea, I think. 
I think each of us, Covey says, I think each of us have an internal monitor or sense, a conscience. There you go. He refers to conscience that gives us an awareness of our own uniqueness and singular contributions that we can make. In Frankel's words, everyone has his own specific vocation or mission in life. Therein he cannot be replaced, nor can his life be repeated. Thus, everyone's task is as unique as his specific opportunity to implement it. Um, when I first started working with my jiu-jitsu coach, who is also my, he j- trains me as if I'm an athlete in all of the other things of my life. Um, Rich, one of the first things that he had me do is he's like, hey, so you're not, you're not like selling on the doors with your sales reps right now. Because I was managing 200 plus um, sales reps this last year. And he was like, you're not selling. So we need to find something that mimics kind of a sale for you that really embodies your unique contribution to the world. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And he's like, well, we're going to talk a little bit about first. I'll show you what I mean. But our first step is we're going to we're going to try to, in his words, detect. he didn't say this, but as I'm interpreting in Covey's words, we're going to detect what your unique, um, what are you best at? That's how he actually said it. But we're going to detect your unique uh, contribution, the things that are uniquely yours and your skill set. I was like, okay, that's interesting. So we, we spent like two calls or sessions on um, – on him trying to, on him helping me under uncover this. And I've done this a lot with my therapist as well. Um, Cody Hawes, where we've talked about like, what's that unique contribution that you can use for the projects that will tie up your passion and energy to go do good for people. Really cool idea, right? Well, that's what Covey's saying is like our conscience allows us to detect that unique mission. So one of the cool things that we did uh, with Rich and I is like, we basically said, what's my unique, uh, what are my unique traits and strengths? And then we boiled them down into a metric that we could we could record. And then we basically, I had to report to him every day how many times I exercised my unique tr- strengths. And we counted that as like a sale essentially, but mostly because I was trying to, the reason why I approached Rich to coach me was like, I don't want to get complacent essentially in my life. Um, I feel like I, you know, I have a boss and a business partner and like I, I am accountable to people, but not in the same way as like, uh, an athlete is accountable to a coach. It's as if I am, I'm the coach and um, the GM is running a bunch of different teams. So I would, didn't want to get complacent. And that's where he was like, well, I'll, you know, I'll help you out. And uh, we started our, that's how we started our podcast, anti-fragile podcast, which has been freaking awesome. Game changer, life changing for me personally. Anyway, that's a kind of a unique way to, to look at that. And so maybe that's what you do too, is like you say, okay, what am I best at? Oh, and by the way, I went in the next week after me doing this for a week during the during the sales season, I went to one of my sales offices when I was there training and I basically I was doing some individual role plays with some of the salesmen and I'm just I always ask in my heart like what's the thing that I could do to help this person that like is unique to them that would be unique to them that's not just a generic like hey sales principle and um, like what does this person actually need? I usually have like a prayer in my heart to do that. Um, or just, you can think of it as a thought in my heart, I guess. And so I'm training with this individual sales rep who had kind of been struggling. And then I was like, you know what, man, let me just ask you a question. Like, what do you think you're best at when you're talking to people? And he's like, what do you mean? Like on the doors? And I was like, just in general, what do people, what are you best at? Like, what's your unique trait or skill that you have that nobody else has? Like, what's the, what's the thing that you bring to the table when you are talking to someone like in a conversation, in a sale with your friends that nobody else has? And he's like, you know what? my unique uh, trait is that like, I genuinely care about people when I'm talking to them and I can almost like feel it as I'm talking. It's like, you know what? Okay. Today, I don't care how many sales you get. You're going to do that. That's all you're going to do. And I just want you to count for me how many times you do the thing that you're best at with people. And he went from, he had gotten uh, zero sales for the last couple of days. And the next day he got five, next day he got six, next day he got four. And that's all he was doing. We weren't counting sales. Although I was seeing the sales come in we were counting how many times he did what he was best at his uniqueness about him in that process of conversing with people. Um, and and then he's like, I, part of what he said was I connect easily with people. Um, and it's so true. Like he totally does. And so I wonder, I almost wonder how much of an increase in effectiveness we would have in the things that we are setting out to do, whether they be obviously like in a sales season, you should definitely be doing this, but also just in your relationships. If you just counted how many times you employed your unique traits, attributes, and skills to bless other people in those interactions. 
if you could count that as a metric every day and not just like a check the box type of thing, but actually put your whole heart into it to truly benefit other people. I just wonder how much increase in effectiveness and output we would see, not only just in the immediate results, like for example, the sales revenue increase, but also in how you feel about your relationships and how people feel about you in those relationships. Um, I definitely found my, for myself that it was massively beneficial for my own well-being because I felt that I was getting back to the core of contributing to being a, a person for others and like actually truly loving and caring about them. That just feels good, you know? Okay, let's get back into this. So I, I really liked that, that part um, here. We detect our missions rather than invent them. Until you accept the idea that you're responsible, that you're the programmer, you really won't invest in writing the program. Love that, dude. Um, as proactive people, we can begin to give expression to what we want and to be and do in our lives. All right. This next part, he talks about use your whole brain. Um, this is kind of an interesting concept. It, it doesn't fit like perfectly well with neuroscience, but he's using it as like this conceptual idea. Our self-awareness empowers us to examine our own thoughts, <clears throat> which is cool. It's, I talked about that in my float tank uh, episode the other day. Um, there are two unique human endowments that enable us to practice habit two, imagination and conscience. So our, the self-endowment of self-awareness or the, per, the human endowment of self-awareness allows us to become proactive through self-awareness and take hold and control um, of our lives. But then create actually building the first creation, the blueprint, it employs imagination and conscience. So those are the primary functions of what Covey would refer to as the right side of the brain. And again, he's being conceptual about this. This isn't like, he's not like neuroscience backing this. Understand how to tap into that part of your brain capacity greatly increases our first creation ability. Um, a great deal of research has been conducted for decades on what has come to be called uh, brain dominance theory. And again, this is, uh, the theory itself is somewhat obsolete. However, well, maybe um, in some sense, but all of Covey's principles here are still really sound. And I study neuroscience almost every day. I'm fascinated by it. Um, essentially, the conceptually, the left hemisphere or so is more logical. Like there's parts of your brain that are more logical, verbal. And then there's other parts that are more intuitive and creative. And that is true. Like when you look at brain scans of people when they're in meditative states and their brain waves start to hit into this theta wave state, they become more creative. Different parts of their brain light up. If they're more focused and they're looking for more logical, or more, if they're focused more logical, for example, then other parts of their brain light up that are not the same as the creative hemispheres. Um, some parts of the brain deal with words. Other parts deal with pictures. So part is literal, part is more creative. Um, other with parts and specifics. And then the other side or part of the brain with holes and the relationship between the parts. One part of the brain or hemisphere of the brain deals with analysis, which means to break apart. The other hemisphere or other parts of your brain will light up when you are putting things together, um, deals with putting things together. Some, uh, one part deals with sequ sequential thinking, ordered thinking. The other part deals with simultaneous and holistic thinking. So wisdom, it's, that's interesting. The, uh, one of them is time bound, the other is time free. So that's like when you get into a meditative state, you'll find that, um, time passes like that, your perception of time. But when you're in, when you're in a sequential thinking state, that's or a literal state, time will typically be much more, much slower because you're thinking in sequence rather than in whole. Really fascinating. I'm actually doing a study right now on the science of making and breaking habits and to implement it some into some of our sales training and uh, into really this is the high performance training program um, or optimal performance training program. And uh, it's been interesting to watch how all of the stuff that Covey says, even though he was using different language for it, um, is still so applicable, even from a neuroscience perspective, like absolutely still applicable. Although people use all of these aspects of their brain, typically they're more dominant in one or the other. Um, the ideal is to cultivate your ability to increase in all those things, uh, in your ability to use those different aspects of your brain, literal versus creative, et cetera. But people tend to stay in the comfort zone of their dominant hemisphere or the dominant portions of their brain and process every situation according to either the one portion or the other. In the words of Abraham Maslow, Maslow, he that is good with a hammer tends to think everything is a nail. <laughs> I love that. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. 
uh, this is another factor that affects the young lady, old lady perception. Basically, this is another thing that, re that affects the like how we view the world syndrome and and be becoming controversial because of how we view the world. And uh, so people who operate or who are better at one or the other literal versus creative thinking and haven't developed one side or the other, because both of them can be developed. Um, they tend to view the world in different ways. We live in primarily a left, he's going to call this left brain dominant world, so more creative, where words and measurement logic, oh, sorry, no, not creative, it's the other one, it's literal, where words and measurement and logic are enthroned. And the more creative, intuitive, sensing, artistic aspect of our nature is often subordinated. I would actually say that it's probably shifting, um, shifting the other way right now, currently. When he wrote this, maybe it was different. Many of us find it more difficult to tap into that other side of our brain. Right now, I think there's a heavy push in just culture um for the creative free flowing part and that, that tends to be um developed in people who have practiced that stuff but like they're where that leaves room to me this is where my competitive nature comes out is like where that leaves massive holes gaping holes to be able to go and just dominate in like business and life is like if you can develop the other aspect that other people just aren't focusing on very much as we become aware of its different cap capacities we can consciously use our minds to meet asp uh, meet specific needs in more effective ways. And then he, next time, what we're going to talk about is the way to tap into the <clears throat> the part of our brain that will allow us to actually sense that unique human endowment, which is really fascinating. I'm going to bring in. I'm actually going to study this next section before I do my next uh, next podcast, next video, because I'm going to bring in some of the neuroscience that I'm studying that it, I did not do the studies for. I just stuff I'm reading from highly acclaimed experts, and see if we can actually match this idea of. How do you, you detect your unique human endowment? Use conscience and imagination to build the first creation for your life in a way that is most optimal and will achieve the highest results and the highest satisfaction and, and wellness and meaning in your life. How do we do that and then tie in some like science to make, make it um, so that we understand like what's actually going on there? I think it's going to be really fascinating. If you guys like the study today, make sure that you uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and where I talk about all things related to the things I'm fascinated about is like how to persuade people from an ethical standpoint, true centered, true centered character development, and then true centered leadership. Make sure you follow me on all the other audio platforms and I'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks.